Good afternoon and welcome to Praxis Peace Institute's Friday Zoom series. I'm Georgia Kelly, the director of Praxis. Today we have the honor of interviewing an outstanding radio host, historian, author, psychologist, and all around Renaissance man, the extraordinary Tom Hartman. He is a New York Times bestselling author and quintessential progressive talk show host. His daily three hour program is syndicated worldwide and reaches over half a billion homes. As a journalist, Hartman has covered many international hotspots, including Egypt, Uganda, the Philippines, Colombia, and India, among others. He helped set up famine relief programs, schools, and refugee centers in these areas. He's also a psychotherapist and has written books on ADHD, in addition to his politically oriented books. Tom is also a brilliant historian who specializes in American history and actually Thomas Jefferson. So welcome, Tom. It's great to have you with us today. Thanks, Georgia. Great to see you again. Still letting people in. Uh, but I want to start, the first question I want to begin with, I know you have some really good solutions in the uh, back part of your book, which I want to get to today because everyone is always asking, well, it's great that you tell us these things, but what are the solutions? And you have them. But I want to start with some of the background that you talked about, and that is the connection between the natives in the East Coast, uh, mainly the Cherokees and the Iroquois Confederation, and what their impact was on the Constitution and what the relationship was between them and Jefferson. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, in, in fact, if I could actually back up a little bit to a much larger picture, um, if if you when you look at the Native Americans, what you're looking at are societies that spent, you know, over 10,000 years on this continent doing trial and error, uh, trying to figure out the best way to live, um, you know, without conquest until we came along, until Europeans came along. And if democracy is the default state of humanity, you would expect to see an awful lot of democracy in a situation like that. And that's exactly what uh, we found at first contact with Native communities. Not all Native communities uh, are egalitarian or democratic, but the majority. And uh, we've also, I talked in the book about, you know, this research that was done in the UK, finding that um, democracy is actually the default decision-making process for all animals. Um, the, this whole idea that uh, the alpha male or the alpha animal in some cases, it's a female, makes the decisions for the group that is completely wrong. Uh, the alpha animal has first choice of sexual partner, which, uh, you know, comports with Darwin's theory of natural selection that you're passing along the strongest genes. But uh, generally speaking, throughout nature, decisions are made democratically. Uh, uh, majority rules, 50, 51% plus. Um, so, and the, the studies are in the book. It's really an, an amazing thing. So, in Europe, however, you know, we, we uh, the, the old Whig histories of England suggest that people were living democratically before the Roman conquest in the year 150 BC, more or less. And uh, Jefferson was a big fan of those of those histories. Um, we we tend to tell ourselves that we got our democracy from white Europeans, first from, you know, Greeks and Romans. Um, but our form of government really doesn't much resemble Greece's democracy or Rome's Republic, um, although we have a Senate, but that's, you know, just in name only uh, the comparison. Um, it's It was really a, a, a brand new thing in, in many regards, at least for Europeans. And um, in the in the early 1700s, around the 1720s, the French uh, fur trappers had gotten very, very successful at penetrating the uh, eastern part of the Midwest, the uh, the Ohio River Valley, the, uh, you know, Indiana, uh, western Pennsylvania, western New York State. And uh, they encountered the the Huron uh, tribe, which actually welcomed them and did trade with them. And along with the French came these French missionaries, uh, these Jesuit miss missionaries, and they set up shop in the, in the uh, early 1700s. And every year they would write a, a, a fairly long, sometimes 100 pages or more, um, summary of their year, of their experience living among the savages. And they were describing these democratic societies and uh, these were sent back to France and they were published every year and they became major bestsellers in France from the 1720s through the 1770s. And this 
uh, produced then, uh, it, it kind of collided with another fad in France at the time, which was the salons, where mostly wealthy women with large homes would invite a, um, a famous speaker to come. Uh, Jefferson and Franklin, in fact, were frequent speakers in salons and when they lived in Paris um, at different times. And uh, one of the things that these uh, people running the salons really wanted was to meet these Indians that they had been reading about, that everybody in France was talking to. And so the French missionaries organized a couple of trips with leaders of the Huron who spoke fluent French to France to, uh, to, to attend these events. And when the, when the Huron leaders came, they, they just openly took on the French uh, idea of governance and economy, pointing out that in their societies, they didn't have poverty, they didn't have great wealth, uh, they didn't have prisons. They didn't have uh, police. Um, you know that that uh, basically saying you guys have this all wrong. You know, <laughs> this this thing with kings and and rich people and and poor people. This doesn't make any sense. And uh, so, you know, one of the stories we tell ourselves is that okay, if we didn't get democracy from the white Europeans uh, of old, from the Greeks and the Romans, then we got it from the white Europeans of more recent times, you know, Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau and Diderot and uh, Montesquieu and, and, and whatnot. But it turns out that they actually were informed by these French salons. John Locke has a footnote in one of his books about attending one of these events. So uh, it's interesting that, that, you know, I mean, for many of the founders, they they knew the Indians very well. And I, in the book, you know, I opened the book with a story of Thomas Jefferson being at a farewell ceremony for Anna Set and him and John Adams talking about, you know, all the Indians that they had in their homes and that they knew and that they worked with and, and, and whatnot. So there were some of the founders who really understood that we were forming a government based on ideas that were basically appropriated from the Iroquois Confederacy. Um, but a lot of the founders didn't know that, and, you know, didn't have contact with Native Americans, and, and they were happy to just, you know, read John Locke and, and John Jacques Rousseau. Um, but that's that's how it all came about. All right. Well, I wanted to uh, maybe have you talk a little bit about the relationship that Jefferson had with the Iroquois. And you you referred to, well, first of all, I wanted to tell everybody about your book, The Hidden uh, History of Democracy, which is the book we're talking about today and the content from which we're talking about. And it is also available at our local bookstore in Sonoma, Reader's Books, just so you know that. Um, maybe a little bit about uh, Jefferson's relationship. And I know you referred to um, the Dawn of Everything by Graeber and Wengro, who mentioned Candiaronk also, who yep. went to uh, France. So I think you've talked a lot about that, but if you want to add anything, that would be great because I think Jefferson's relationship with them is really interesting. And then I, I wanted to go on to the secular origins of America because we are really up against this, um, well, a whole group of people who want to turn it into a theocracy, kind of an authoritarian theocracy. So I'd like to get your thoughts on that, too. Sure. Well, first off, uh, Peter Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson's father, was a map maker, and he traveled all around uh, Virginia mapping the Virginia Territory, and much of it was still Indian country. And so he spoke several Native American languages and got to know the Indians. And they frequently would come and the Indian leaders, various Indian leaders would uh, frequently come and stay at Shadwell at the family farm. Um, and Thomas was exposed to this. He would travel with his father when he was young. His father died when he was 14 or 15. And um, so, uh, you know, he was, like I said, he was he was quite familiar with with uh, with Native Americans and their forms of government uh, and like that. In terms of the secular origin of the United States, um, the founders, uh, the founding generation, uh, still remembered the, the the Salem witch trials and uh, which was just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, John Greenleaf Whittier wrote, you know, the day the the, the women came from Dover. Um, uh, I think it was in the late 1700s. I mean, there was you know this was still going on. Um, and I'd have to go back and look at when that poem was written, but in any case, and, and, uh, they didn't want a theocracy. I mean, it was just, you know, they, uh, they from the lessons of the, of the British, uh, you know, of, uh, revolution or the British civil war to the, uh, uh, to 
to the uh, Salem witch trials to the, to Massachusetts, almost not making it into the into the into the uh, nation, because at the time that it, you know they wanted to join the, the thirteen colonies, um, they had laws requiring you to pay taxes to support the churches and, and compulsory Sunday school attendance, or Sunday uh, Sunday church attendance. And uh, they had to drop all that stuff in order to become part of the Republic. Jefferson and Madison had an ongoing kind of debate for much of their lives. Um, Jefferson was convinced that if a priest, uh, his generic term for a religious leader, uh, ever became the, uh, uh, the president, that the Republic would be in big trouble. Um, Madison, who was a Christian, Jefferson was not, he was a deist. Um, Madison, who was Jefferson's protege, was convinced that his beloved church would be at risk if the government ever involved itself in religion, including supporting churches. And so, you know, they had this debate about which was worse. And it turned out they were both right. <laughs> you know? But uh, Madison was so emphatic about this that when he became president in 1809, his first veto was uh, to veto a bill to provide for uh, ongoing support of the poorhouse in Washington, D.C., which George Washington's administration had started. Uh, you know, it was a, a, a socialist experiment. It provided uh, housing, medical care, food, and clothing for poor indigent people in, in D.C. And there was this minor religious revival that happened in the first decade of the 1800s. And, and um, uh, so the Congress sent to Madison, to President Madison, a bill uh, that was running the money for the poorhouse instead of the government directly running the poorhouse as it had been up to that point uh, they were going to run it through a church in uh, in dc and madison vetoed that and in his veto message he said this you know if the federal government giving any money at all to a religious organization under any circumstances um, has the potential to not only corrupt the federal government but to corrupt the church itself and this is something that must never be allowed so, you know, which is obviously the complete opposite of George W. Bush's faith-based initiatives, which was just a way of trying to get Republican support from the evangelical community. Um, Reagan kind of sold out that whole situation. That was the plan, definitely. Um, I wanted to bring up something as, as we go into the solutions that, you, well, first of all, I guess the problem to talk about the war on democracy that you talk about in the book. Uh, and some of the solutions to that war on democracy. I wanted to bring up one thing that I thought was interesting that you have in the book, and that was the boycott that was led by Penelope Baker, um, a woman who was part of a boycott for British goods, whether it be clothing or tea or other merchandise. Um, and it reminded me of the great boycott that happened in the 1960s and how successful it was, partially because in those days, women did most of the shopping, grocery shopping. And when we would give flyers to them, they got it. They got what the boycott was about. They supported it. They didn't buy the grapes and it worked. And now we're, we're not seeing that kind of strategy at all. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas about boycotts. Well, I think our media has become so centralized that it's hard for boycotts to get any traction. Um, uh, also, media is afraid of supporting them for fear that uh, they will alienate advertisers. Um, the great boycott of the 1960s, I remember it well, Cesar Chavez, um, it, it, it was successful and it wasn't, which is really interesting. Now, if you go back and read the history of it, um, the economic impact on the grape producers was fairly minor. Um, the the reason that they that they gave in and and within five years by the way they had basically broken all their promises and and Chavez was never able to recover from that but the reason that they gave in was because of the moral uh, pressure not the financial pressure and uh, and and the you know Penelope Baker and her friends they were they were also making a moral case you know for for not buying British goods and you know which kind of led to the Boston Tea Party in some ways. So uh, making a moral case in today's media environment is really difficult. <laughs> you know, it's it's, it's just not a moral media. Yeah, we've got basically nine corporations that control about 80% of all of our media. And, and um, you know, it's just very, very difficult. Well, that's why we're doing the discussion on propaganda, because it's very really clear that we can see it from white, right wing sources, but we have a little more difficulty seeing it in our own sources like the New York Times, CNN, MSNBC. I think this is where we need to be more critical. So uh, I want to get to some of the solutions you offered because you talk about the modern war on democracy. 
And the fact that electors in each of the states could actually refuse to certify an election is shocking, but we saw the first possibility of that with Biden's election. Um, so I'd like you to talk a little bit about that danger and uh, then some of the solutions that you've pointed out to the um, war on democracy that we're going through right now. Sure. Well, the, the the conception of the Electoral College, and you get this if you read Madison's notes on the Constitutional Convention, the conception of the Electoral College was based on the problem that they were facing. I mean, how do you elect a president in a country that's larger than Europe? Uh, or, or at least, you know, vertically up and down the East Coast, a, a longer distance than pretty much any of the distances across Europe. I mean, it, it, it could take months for mail. There was no uh, really well-defined post office um, outside of the big cities in the East Coast. It was run by the British. They read all the mail. Um, uh, there were no national newspapers. We didn't have the telegraph uh, even. I mean, Ben Franklin was still flying kites trying to figure out what electricity was. And so the question was, how does somebody in Georgia vote voting for president? You know, what happens if they vote for president and the person that they vote for who never visited Georgia, who just was campaigning up in the east, northeast, um, turns out to be a scoundrel, uh, to, to quote Hamilton in Federalist, I think, 56, a, a man of low moral character. And so the solution that they came up with was that the electors, that each state that instead of voting for president, you would vote for electors who were pledged to a presidential candidate. And those electors would then, uh, in theory, I mean, it didn't, they never generally did it, but in theory, those electors would then meet in Washington, D.C. in mid-December and uh, get to know the candidates and, and be able to identify a, a scoundrel if they saw one. And therefore, the Constitution says the electors don't have to cast their ballots for the person that they were sent to vote for. Um, so, you know, it was actually a kind of an elegant solution to a real problem in 1787. By 1830, it was no longer a problem. We had a telegraph. We had the telegraph. We were starting to have, you know, railroads and whatnot, but certainly by the 1850s and 1860s, it was solid. And in fact, in 1974, we, you know, Congress came one vote short of doing away with the Electoral College altogether. But then in 2000, uh, Al Gore won that election by half a million votes. George W. Bush lost it by a half million votes, but the Electoral College uh, the, you know, in Florida pushed him over the top. And so you know, after that happened, the Republican Party just fell in love with the Electoral College. And now it's become so partisan that they, you know, and of course, the same thing with Trump, he lost by 3 million votes, uh, but became president because of the Electoral College. So now the Republicans are just embracing the Electoral College. So there is this interstate compact, uh, nationalpopularvote.com is the website for it, where state, because electors don't have to vote for the person that their state voted for, um, each of these states pledges that, um, and, and it won't work until there's 270 electoral votes, until there's enough states representing 270 electoral votes, which is what it takes to make somebody president. But that um, once it's in place, uh, all of the states that are part of it pledge 100% of their electors to whoever wins the national popular vote, regardless of how their state voted. And that would be that, that would be kind of a cool and elegant solution to the problem of this thing that's stuck in the Constitution. However, in just the last few months, the Republican Party has come out and said that if because they just we just got to 205, just uh, I forget which state it was, but we just added another state just a few months ago. And Michigan is probably going to add another, I think, 17 electoral votes uh, soon. So uh, the Republican Party has come out and said that if if that group ever hits 270 electoral votes, they will sue at the Supreme Court to prevent it from happening. Hmm. So some of the, the um, solutions that you recommend, which I think are elegant, as you might put it, uh, would be to expand the Senate and how you would do that, I think is very interesting. We just talked about the Electoral College, the possibility of abolishing it seeming difficult right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, expanding the Supreme Court, expanding the Senate. Um, talk about those two. Sure. The Senate is, right now, the Senate is 50-50. We, literally 50 Democrats and 50 Republicans. And yet the Democrats in the United States Senate represent 41 million more people than do the Republicans. That is not small d democratic. Now, uh, throughout history, we have seen Republican presidents on uh, uh, multiple occasions uh, add states to 
purely for the purpose of getting new Republican senators. Abraham Lincoln needed two new Republican senators. And at the time, it took 120,000 people for a state to qualify, uh, for a territory to qualify for statehood. Uh, that was the threshold for a member of the House of Representatives. The, the Nevada Territory had 7,000 people in it, but Lincoln made it a state anyway because he needed those two Republican senators. Um, that He was followed by Ulysses S. Grant, who did the same thing with Colorado. Colorado only had 30,000 people in it, but he made it a state anyway, even though it didn't have the 120,000 because he needed two more Republican senators. And then in the 1890s, Benjamin Harrison um, came along and he needed he wanted four new Republican senators and the Dakota Territory had just about enough people to be one state, but he split it into two states so he'd get four senators. So that, that's when North and South Dakota were created purely for the purposes of getting four Republican senators. So here you've got eight Republican senators uh, or eight states that were brought into the union way premature, purely you know, to get those senators. I'm arguing that, uh, you know, first of all, Washington, D.C. has, you know, uh, absolutely should be a state. It has a population similar to that of Wyoming or Vermont. Um, Puerto Rico has a population five times that of Washington, D.C. And uh, people living in Puerto Rico are U.S. citizens. They have U.S. passports. They should that should become a state. Um, those would that would probably represent four Democrat Democratic votes. And then if you really wanted to get crazy, the U.S. Virgin Islands uh, has enough people to qualify as a state. And uh, some of the islands in the Pacific, uh, you could arguably make one or two states out of them, uh, you know, the Guam and Solomon Islands and all that stuff. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, the Democrats really need to go to town on this. I mean, at the very least, Puerto Rico and D.C. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems very reasonable, given the history and the recent history. Um, you mentioned um, also expanding the Supreme Court. So maybe right. just say a few things about that and why yeah. and how. Yeah, the the, the Supreme Court uh, is regulated by Congress. Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution says the Supreme Court shall operate under regulations and, ex and, and within exceptions defined by Congress. And uh, Congress has changed the number of people on the court a number of times. It started out at six, as I recall, you know, went up to seven. Uh, went to nine, went to, we actually had 10 at one point, um, uh, back to nine. Um, they, uh, when Andrew Johnson became president, uh, Congress, uh, after Lincoln was assassinated, Congress actually reduced the number of the Supreme Court down to seven um, because they didn't want Andrew Johnson to be able to fill a vacancy that was on the court at the time. Um, and then when Ulysses S. Grant came in, they re-expanded it. So there's a long history of Congress changing the number of uh, Supreme Court justices. The, also, the Supreme, the number of justices, when I, when I went to nine, the rationale was that there were nine uh, circuits in, in the federal court system. There are now 13. So, um, you know, if, if you just want to use that as a metric, you know, having 13 justices makes perfect sense. Also, I think, <clears throat> I think we need to have term limits on, on justices. And that's something that's, you know, within the bounds of the Constitution, as long as after they leave the Supreme Court, they stay on the federal bench, because those are lifetime appointments. They go, go become members of the court, you know, the circuit courts, the courts of appeal. And, um, and we need to impose a, 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 a code of conduct, you know, judicial ethics on the Supreme Court. And all of this is, is easily within the realm of, of the powers that Congress has, notwithstanding what Sam Alito wrote in the Wall Street Journal day before yesterday. Didn't see that. Um, yeah, he said, the, he said Congress has no control. Congress has no right to regulate the Supreme Court. And I mean, yeah. you know, uh, Article 3, Section 2 literally says Congress shall regulate the Supreme Court. <laughs> it's just Well, you know how they they, they lie. I wanted to, to bring people's attention to the fact that you also have a hidden history book on the Supreme Court. Yes. The, the series of nine and books. The Betrayal of America. It's good. It's the Betrayal of America. The Court and the Betrayal of America. So this is a, a series of, of nine books so far, if, if you don't know that. And each one of them, one deals with guns, which I didn't get into today because I thought you've got a book on that. People can get that book. Um, but there, but the series is really worthwhile having it. I think it's a it's a course in history, actually, American history. So I'm going to uh, close off my questions for now and open it up for audience questions um, because we have a limited time and I'd like to get your input too. So as you raise your hand uh, or as I call on you, you can unmute, but otherwise, please stay mute. Okay, uh, Kim. 
Kimberly? Hi. So I, I wanted to add a little bit about the Iroquois Confederacy and then ask a different question. So I've studied it. Um, I had the good fortune of traveling for 10 days with an Iroquois chief to go the path of the peacemaker who brought peace to the warring Iroquois nations and helped craft the great law of peace, which is the Iroquois constitution. And a part of the constitution is checks and balances. And that's a key part of what our founding fathers took in our constitution was checks and balances that we have you know, between the executive, judicial and legislature. But what they didn't take was the role of women. You know, The role of clan mothers was an extremely important role in Iroquois society. They were elder women selected in the community. They selected the chiefs. If the chiefs didn't carry out the policies that the community wanted, women had the power to depose them a power I sure wish we had today. But our founding fathers completely ignored the role of women, which was at, at this chief that I traveled with said, this was one of the key reasons why the Iroquois society declined so much as it has, and why he was so sad that women were not you know, a key part of it, as well as a key part of our constitution. So that's just a little background from my research. I don't know if you have any comments, but I wanna ask a very different right. question as well. Um, and that is, um, I lived in near DC for 13 years. DC people resent the fact that they're taxed, but they don't have a vote. Uh, of course, there's Eleanor Norton Holmes, who's been there for, uh, for a long time. But of course, there's Republican opposition because it would be two Democratic senators. But be, besides uh, Republican opposition, what are the other stumbling blocks? I think is a constitutional issue because there are 50 states and this would become the 51st state, but what is the what are the other stumbling blocks? It only requires a simple majority in the House and Senate to uh, accept a state. And uh, so the step one would be for Democrats to regain control of the House of Representatives. Um, it would almost certainly be filibustered in the Senate. And if we still have the Joe Manchin, Kirsten Cinema taking money from right-wing billionaires problem, um, you know, it could be a challenge because uh, you'd have to break the filibuster. But that's basically all it takes. Um, it's not it's not particularly difficult, which is why, you know, Lincoln and Grant and Harrison did it so easily. I mean, yeah, and, you know, and of course, Eisenhower, you know, bringing um, Hawaii and Alaska into the Union, but that was not... Uh, for done for political purposes, that was done for largely economic purposes. These territories had functionally become states. Okay, uh, was there another part of the question? Well, no, I I don't know if you had any comments on the Iroquois. I just was adding. Oh, you're, to you're absolutely what right. You had said. Uh, my understanding is that only the women could vote, essentially, and uh, you know on on those on those uh, major issues on you know on who was in charge. And um, there's a correspondence between John Adams and his wife where she uh, perhaps alludes to this um, and tells him, you know, remember the ladies and we will form a, re a rebellion if you don't uh, give us rights. But uh, John Adams wrote back this really haughty letter saying we will not surrender our manly prerogatives. And, you know, so, you know, they, basically what they said was, oh, this is interesting. The Iroquois only let one gender vote. That's a good idea. Um, but they got the wrong gender, you know. <laughs> uh, Ray, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, Tom, uh, good to see you again. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to point out what I think is an interesting irony that uh, you said the Electoral College was um, originally defined to avoid electing scoundrels, and then that's exactly what oh, it ended up doing. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I, I'm, I'm curious about the, uh, you mentioned the interstate compact states, and I'm wondering how that overlaps with the Article 5 states that are pushing, you know, the right wing uh, rewrite the Constitution in their own image, uh, uh, Article 5 uh, effort. Uh, you know, I'm assuming there's no overlap of those states. To the best of my knowledge, there isn't. The the whole Article Five thing is being driven by uh, you know the Coke Network and several other you know right wing billionaire networks. They've been doing rehearsals in Washington D.C. for over a decade every year, uh, you know, bringing in representatives from every state in the union and and practicing you know what they would do when they completely rewrite the Constitution. Uh, there, to the best of my knowledge, they're all red states. Um, yeah. The states that have signed on to the interstate compact, to the best of my knowledge, are all blue states or purple states so far. So it's yeah. uh, 
pretty interesting pretty bifurcated interesting divide now now can congress prevent the supreme court from blocking a law can they i know you've talked about it on your show before but i'm a little unclear about it where if congress enacts a law that they can put a provision in there that the Supreme Court can't touch it. Is that correct? And That is correct. Uh, it's never been subject to judicial review. The Supreme Court has never ruled on whether they have that power. Um, uh, so, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty around it. When John Roberts worked for, uh, for uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, he argued uh, his job, he was in the Justice Department at the time, and his job, or he would actually was working out of the White House, his job was to figure out a way that the Republican-controlled Congress could overturn Roe v. Wade and Brown v. Board. And what he came up with was Congress can simply pass a law saying that um, uh, this, this law is not subject to judicial review and you know reversing both those decisions. And he argued strenuously for that. It's uh, Most of his memo is reprinted in my book on the Supreme Court. Um, I doubt he thinks that way any longer now that he's on the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, interestingly, the, the, the piece of legislation that passed on a bipartisan basis, that passed Congress um, about a month and a half ago to uh, resolve the debt ceiling, has a paragraph in it that says this law is not subject to judicial review. So, uh, and, that, and that has been incorporated into literally hundreds of laws over the past 100 years or so. It's just that it's never been tested. I see. And and just one other question, and I know you don't haven't really touched on this, but, you know, in the January 6th overall investigation, I never hear about what happened to the the people who supplied and built that gallows. You know, that yeah, seems right. like a pretty big presentation deal. Yeah. Has yeah. there been anything on that? No, and I'm astonished that they haven't been able to find any pictures. You know, you would think that there there have to be pictures out there, of people building the gallows and, and stuff like that. I mean, it's just I'm still scratching my head on that one. I don't get it. I, you know, I, and I hope that if that is part of a larger conspiracy, because I see January 6th not so much as an effort to stop the count, but as an effort to hang Mike Pence, to, to murder the vice president so that Donald Trump could declare a state of emergency and lock the country down. Um, and uh, if that, if my uh, interpretation of that is correct, then, you know, I hope Jack Smith is all over it. I just don't know. And all they had to do is wait because Mike uh, Pence seems to be hanging himself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> politically, yeah. Well, they think, we think they are. Uh, Katie has a question. Hey, Katie. Katie, what did you Yes, know? thank you for being here, Tom. Uh, I enjoyed listening to a lot of your podcasts again recently to get updated for today. And I was interested in how much you fought with your father. Uh, I guess you were in extremes politically. And I'm involved with psycho, I'm a psychotherapist, and I know you have a background in that. So my question is this How do you see the uh, possible change in the increase in hatred? that's happening what do you do you think that the infrastructures you've suggested today will change the amount of hatred that's going on the psychological uh increase in this kind of uh vicious energy yeah i i don't I don't know. Uh, it's it seen. I mean, if you go back and you look at the history of countries that go through this, whether it's Germany in the 30s or Rwanda in the 90s, um, it's when hate is being driven uh, endogenously from within the country um, by people who have a, a a a benefit out of that hate, and typically it's it's to seize political and economic power. Uh, and, and we have that right now. We've got a Republican Party that uh, whose policies are so insanely unpopular. You know, let's more tax cuts for billionaires, deregulate uh, everything, do away with Social Security and Medicare. I mean, these are literally their policies. Nobody's going to vote for that. So instead, they say, hey, you know, if, if you hate black people too, vote with us, you know, that kind of thing. And, and uh, as long as our country is being driven by hate, it's going to be re a, a real challenge. And, you know, we've been through cycles of this throughout our history. You know, the, the Klan, I live in Oregon, the Klan actually ran Oregon for about 12 years, you know, back in the early, uh, early part of the last century, um, openly ran Oregon and, uh, and lynched white people who opposed them. 
So uh, I, I don't see any easy answers here. I don't think that you can, you know, if we just did away with Fox News tomorrow or something, it's not going to solve the problem. Um, you know, we've, we've always had this. It's just that, you know, in the 60s and 70s in particular, which is when I was, you know, in, in the radio on, on doing radio news from 68 to 78, um, the, we, we largely ignored these movements. I mean, the John Birch Society was very much around there. You know, Fred Koch was funding it, the, the, the impeach Earl Warren signs all over the place. Um, but, you know, we just, it, it didn't get reported. It didn't get covered. It didn't, it was a fringe movement. It was viewed as a fringe movement. There's a societal consensus that these were fringe people. Yeah. And um, as long as the Republican Party continues to embrace these militias and these and these bigots and, and basically, you know, the modern day Klan, um, it's going to be difficult to to marginalize them. And that reform is going to have to probably come from within the GOP. And there, there are some signs that it might. Mitt Romney starting to speak out loudly. You've got a few Republicans who are speaking up. Chris Christie, um, who's, you know, a very effective hater, but he's still, um, you know, he's he has boundaries, too. Um, you know, there's there. I think that the fever will break, frankly, I, and, and but I think what's probably going to break it is a massive loss in 2024. Yeah. Uh, you know, knock wood, right? Knock wood. Yeah, it kind of reminded me of the George Wallace campaign in 1968. Mm -hmm. Yeah, although that, Wallace toned his rhetoric down a lot for that. Yes, campaign. he did later. Yeah. But during yeah. that time, there was a lot of hatred around that, especially in the South. Um, you know, I, I wanted to say I really appreciated your comment, uh, your re reference to, is this correct, morbid wealth? Yeah, morbidly rich people. Is morbidly is rich people. That's <laughs> fabulous. It's just Thank so you. perfect. Uh, yeah. So you and your, I'll just end with, so you and your father disagreed all the time and reportedly it was okay. Well, how did you do it? Uh, we ultimately decided, by the way, I just got a notice on my computer. It says your system has run out of application memory, force quit applications. So if I vanish, my apologies. Um, but uh, my dad and I uh, were very close when I was young. And, and in fact, when I was 14, I went, or 13 in 1964, I went door to door with my dad for Barry Goldwater. Um, but by the time I was 16, I had moved out of the house. I had joined SDS. I was going to Michigan State University. And, um, and I was, and, and part of the reason I moved out of the house was because I was just getting in these, you know, loud uh, fights with my dad about politics. So, uh, you know, by the time I was 17 or 18, we had just basically decided uh, that we would not discuss politics with each other anymore. Oh. Okay. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, put our lives back together and our relationship back together. And, you know, when my dad died, I, it was in his living room and I was sitting there with my brothers. In fact, I had my hand on his shoulder as he died. And I looked across and on the wall next to him, uh, he was in a hospital bed in the living room. Um, on the wall next to him were his two favorite pictures, which is one was me shaking hands with Pope John Paul II. And the other was George W. Bush on the aircraft carrier <laughs> in Lincoln declaring mission accomplished. So, you know, he died a Republican. Um, he was never a crackpot Republican. He was an Eisenhower Republican. Um, he kind of tolerated George W. Bush. But, um, you know, at, at some point you have to decide which is more important, your family or your politics. And we both decided that our family was more important than our politics. I think both things happen too. Uh, and I wanted to just comment as of course I tend to do is the nation that we saw with the Iroquois, a very similar a uh, situation with what the Mondragon cooperatives have created in the Basque region. It's an extraordinary uh, place where there isn't the great wealth or the poverty. It's really in the middle. Most of the economic reality there is. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, I mean, they've, they've learned how to do it, but they understand limits. They understand enough, which is a hard sell in America, I think, especially with the kind of media we have. And, advertising. So if there aren't more questions, I know you wanted to um, leave a little early, so I don't want to keep you if we don't have to, Tom. Thank okay. you so much. Uh, Kim, let's just do one last one with Kim. Okay. Um, I read recently, I can't remember, it was in the Post or the Times, of a columnist that said a way to weaken the Electoral College is to expand the House of Representatives. You, you've talked about the Senate. And then he was saying, he's from Massachusetts. He said, Massachusetts is a small state because originally the Electoral College, of course, was set up to give small states some 
equal um, power uh, to you know the, the uh, larger states. And so he was saying to weaken it to uh, since our population has grown, you know, to uh, gain more seats in the House. What do you think of that idea? Do you think I that think it's would... a good idea? I think the House should be expanded. I think the the threshold for for House members should be uh, reduced. Um, uh, there is a point where a legislature gets unwieldy. I mean, India is, is I believe, it's over five hundred people. Um, so, but I, you know, yeah, I'd like to see it. You know, f at least fifty new members of the House of Representatives, and I think it would work to the benefit of the Democratic Party. But I don't think it would be quite as uh, uh, or anywhere near as successful as as modifying the Senate. Um, this, uh, but not neither one for the purposes of the Electoral College. I mean, the main the main the problem with the Electoral College is not going to go away. It's it's uh, because it's state based. So uh, you know, you you would be adding members of the House, but you would be adding them kind of in a uniform fashion across the country. So you, it wouldn't necessarily give you a huge Democratic advantage. Expanding the Senate would help. Uh, but that's only within the Senate. That's not going to have much impact on the Electoral College. The solution to the Electoral College is either to amend the Constitution or, or you know, have that interstate compact be, you know, hit the 270 mark and then be approved by the Supreme Court. To, to abolish the Electoral College, uh, what was the process for that? It would require an amendment to the Constitution. It would. Okay, so that's much harder. Three quarters of the House and Senate and three quarters of the states. It's not going to happen. That Yeah, that's going to be a very hard push. So I want to thank you, Tom, for spending time with us today. This has been very enlightening. And I want to mention the book again, which is uh, The Hidden History of American Democracy. It's Tom's ninth book in the Hidden History series. And our bookstore in Sonoma has it, so you can get it there. Thank you, Georgia. And thank you, everybody, for showing up tonight. It's great to thank see you all. Yeah. You. And I've included all his links in the chat. Okay. Cool. And I'm going to send out to everyone who was on this and who registered who didn't make the live talk, I'm going to send out that old interview you did on Dubrovnik, Tom. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Because it's fun. Thank you. And I'm going to bail out here. So okay. thank you so much. Good night. Bye, Tom.